we've talked about this before, that a species is a group of organisms that are reproductively isolated, which means that they can only successfully reproduce with others of the same kind. And when we're talking about reproductively isolated and successful reproduction means that not only can you have sex, but you can have offspring who are fertile and they can have offspring. So this is a really important part of being a species and what isolates us from one another is that you can't have offspring who can be fertile and have offspring with a different kind. So humans, for example, we can only have fertile offspring with other humans. Or if we're talking about birds, there might be 100,000 different kinds of species of birds. So even if we're looking at warblers, there's, I believe, about 400 different species of warblers. And even though there might be two species that look very similar, even if they can mate, the offspring will not be fertile because they are not the same species. So you can be part of the same genus group, but a different species, and that still isolates you. Only if you are the same species can you have fertile offspring. So that's, again, in terms of evolution, this is a key piece, fertile offspring, because you want to keep your group going. Here's two different species of fish. They look very similar. But if they tried to mate, they would not have fertile offspring. So key part of evolution, having fertile offspring so that they can keep the population going. So this is what we call reproductive, again, reproductive isolation. Species are isolated reproductively from other species, other kinds of organisms. We're gonna look at mechanisms that show the differences between species and how they can be reproductively isolated. So even we're gonna go through different kind of levels of isolation. Humans, oh, page 99, yes, thank you so much. Uh, humans, we could technically have sex with chimpanzees. I mean, that would be weird, right? But we, the result of that will not be an organism that can have babies who are also fertile. We can't contribute to the next generation if we have sex with members of other species. So we call these, we're gonna, well, we're gonna start with pre-mating or pre-zygotic mechanisms. The zygote means that you have a sperm and egg that come together to make a cell that can replicate and become an organism. There are all of these different kinds of isolation factors, and all of these will prevent the act of mating or sex from happening. We will go through each one of these. So first is geographic isolation. If we have a group of turtles who live at the bottom of a mountain, and another group of turtles who live in the top of a mountain, and they never travel to the middle of the mountain, they're never going to have the opportunity to even mate. They are in different places, and so they don't ever meet up. They don't live in the same place. That's what we call geographical isolation. Ecological isolation is a little bit more, it's like harder to wrap your brain around maybe, So a good example are fig wasps. Figs, kind of a sweet fruit. There's 
750 species of wasps that help to pollinate figs. They live, all of these, not well, maybe not all, but a lot of these wasps live in the same environment. They live in the same ecosystem, the same place. But those wasps, each species is so focused on one species of fig tree that they never meet up with other species of wasps of the same genus. So if you, even if you live in the same area and you don't meet up with others, you can't reproduce with them. It's kind of like the idea that you might have come to campus and you're sitting next to someone and over the course of the semester you get to talking and you find out that they live a block away from you. And you've never seen them before in your life. That is because you just have, maybe they went to another high school. You went to this high school, they went to that high school because the boundary was right in between your two blocks. And you had these interests and they had those interests. And so you just never met up with that person, even though they lived a block away. It's kind of mind blowing. So that's the idea of ecological isolation, is that you might live in the same direct area, but you just don't do the same thing. So you never meet up. Temporal isolation. Temporal means time. If you are a species who only mates in the fall, and you will never meet up with a species who only mates in the spring, your mating times never happen at the same time. That's temporal isolation. Behavioral isolation. This one I think is the funniest one. Behavioral isolation means that, and it, a lot of species do these behaviors to attract a mate. We see it a little bit differently in humans. So other species, there's a lot of birds who the bird, the male typically tries to attract the female. And the male bird will be like doing this weird dance and the female is either like, ooh, that's hot, or she's like, no, absolutely not. I don't want anything to do with that. Species in our genetics, in our DNA, we are behaviors programmed. I know I talked about that last time. And so why and how the males may do certain dances, it's all programmed in their DNA. They don't consciously think like, I'm gonna do this. It's just like natural, comes to them. So, each species has these different mating behaviors. And within a species, the mating behaviors may be a little bit different. And so the females will watch the mating behaviors and decide or be attracted to whatever that mating behavior is. If you are a different species, a female bird, so if we're talking about warblers again, 400 different species of them, if you have a warbler with one species, a female, and a male of a different species comes and because she looks very similar to his own species and he does his little dance, she, she might be like, that's not normal. That's not like what, what my species does. And so that will isolate them from reproducing. All right, so I've got a couple of examples. The last part of the pre-zygotic isolating mechanisms are the mechanical isolation. Imagine an elephant and a tiny little titi monkey trying to mate. Put a male elephant whose penis is probably bigger than your arm, insert that into a tiny little monkey. Not new. The parts don't fit, so they can't mate. So let's talk about post-zygotic mechanisms, or what we call the post-mating. What this means is that the organisms, the two different species, their parts fit. They mate at the same time. They understand the mating behaviors and like them. Ecologically, they're right there. They see each other. So all of these things happen. Those 
pre-mating or pre-zygotic mechanisms are all in line. But there's going to be issues with either the sperm and egg coming together or the sperm and egg do indeed come together and the offspring doesn't develop fully or the offspring does develop fully, it's born, but it is not fertile. And remember, fertility and the offspring is key to evolution, to keep the species going. Gamete isolation, sorry, gamete incompatibility isolation. So for whatever reason, the sperm and egg don't fuse. we have all of these markers and those surface markers that stick out of our cells they tell a lot of information about that cell so one is that those surface markers in particular if we're talking about the species surface markers every one of our cells has a particular shaped surface marker and the way that cells will work together is that cells will take like their surface marker and they'll go up to another cell and be like oh Oh look, our surface markers fit. We're the same cell of the same species, or the same, they're a cell of the same species. So that's the way our immune system works, is that your white blood cells are, are just like swimming around in the blood, and they're going up to cells within your blood and going like boop, 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 but if you get to something and they're like, oh, wait, this surface marker doesn't fit, then it starts this whole immune response is that they're going to connect to it in a way that they flag it. Like, hey, another kind of white blood cell, you need to gobble this up because this, we don't match surface markers and this does not belong here. So if we have two different species, what can happen is that when the they can have the physical sex and the sperm is inserted into the other species, but the surface markers don't match. And when the surface markers don't match, that means that the sperm cannot fuse with the egg. So that's the first level, very simple. That binding of those surface markers is key for this to bind the sperm and the egg together for the sperm to contribute, it, contribute its nucleus with the DNA to the egg's DNA. Hybrid inviability, this is the next level. Fertilization occurs, but the hybrid, the joining of these two different species it doesn't survive, and it cannot survive on a variety of levels. It could be that it doesn't survive past the sperm and egg come together and it doesn't make that first cell. It could be that it gets like halfway through development internally or when they're, the um, embryo is growing and it just dies off. Could be that it's born and within a few days it dies. So somewhere in that process it dies off. So let's take a look at some issues and why this will happen. So surface markers could be close enough between two different species. When we're talking about chromosomes within a species, that is another key factor to this. So let's say that the egg is a species that has a species number
So the egg species, whatever this is, it has a chromosome number of 22. Every cell in its body, with the exception of sperm and egg, will have 22 chromosomes. The egg and the sperm of the species will carry half of that one set of chromosomes. Remember, we talked about this will be representing homologous pairs of chromosomes that the 22 chromosomes, 11 came from biological mom, 11 came from biological dad to make two sets of every chromosome to give them 22. So the egg is going to have 11 chromosomes to contribute. In this species, there's a chromosome number of 20, two sets of 10, sperm and egg will have 10 chromosomes to contribute. So these two do get together, and when the 10 and the 11 come together, okay, so now we have something different, right? This species has a chromosome number of 20, this one has a chromosome number of 22, now we've got a species of 21 total chromosomes. Do you remember the other day when we talked about the process of DNA to RNA to proteins making everything that is the important stuff in our bodies? That that's what is carried in these 21 chromosomes. In general, a little bit of extra DNA or a little bit of DNA missing in a species something goes wrong during the process of mitosis when these two get together, or it could be something goes wrong and there's some things missing here, that if you have too much DNA or too little DNA, it can result in very bad diseases, syndromes, or perhaps even you're missing some mechanics to this new organism developing fully. Too much DNA, not enough DNA, not a good thing. So we have different levels of what can happen again here. Could be that the organism is aborted. As humans, we would call that a miscarriage. In humans, one in five women have miscarriages, one in five. So every one in five pregnancies results in a miscarriage. So it's pretty regular and common. We just don't talk about it. And it could be that when these two come together, that things are missing, or you have extra things in here that results in the division, what we call cleavage, one cell to two cells, two cells to four cells, eventually like that group of cells, something is missing in there that the cell doesn't continue to develop, or the ball of cells doesn't continue to develop. And that lack of development causes the female's body to try and expel the developing organism. So what we would call a abortion, a natural abortion, or a miscarriage. For example, it could be that in leopard frogs, so if you have a leopard frog and a wood frog, two different species of frogs who are very similar in nature, they do produce a fertile egg. They got an embryo and it's developing, becomes a frog, but within a few days after those frogs are born, they die. So we get that far, but again, there's something missing here or something extra here, and it just causes them to not continue to live. So again, we have different levels of all of this. Hybrid infertility. So we get all the way to the organism, the hybrid between the two is born, but it is not fertile itself. So the offspring, or what as humans we call baby, can't have its own offspring or babies. In evolution, it is so important that you have fertile offspring. We need as a species to keep our species going. So that key piece, remember fitness, is that you can contribute offspring to the population and then also your offspring are fertile and can continue the population on. So a few examples. 
a horse and a donkey, they can mate, they can make a mule, but mules can't have more mules. Mules are sterile. The only way we get mules is to continue to mate these two. There's also the tiger and the lion that you can have them come together and they can make an offspring. Um, and then they're called the liger and the tigon, depending on which the male is in the um, mating situation, but the liger or the tigon are not fertile. They can't continue on to have offspring. Let's take a look at this question. Fruit flies species will look more or less alike. If you have a male and a female fruit fly, how can you prove they're the same species? A, determine the base sequence of the DNA of their chromosomes. So if you are doing an experiment in college, which you will likely, if you take a genetics class, you will work with fruit flies, it's really cool. You follow and track the generations based on the traits that you see. Do you think you will have access to sequencing DNA? No, you don't, right? I mean, ideally you could do that, but again, what if, what if they end up having, what if they're the same amount of chromosomes, just the DNA is arranged differently because they're different species? Also, like their DNA might code for different alleles, so their base sequence would be the same anyway. Right, true. So, so that might not be the best idea here. Examine them closely with a low power microscope, which is what you would do. Compare their physical characteristics to published species key list of characteristics. So we already said they look alike, right? Just because two things look alike doesn't mean they're the same species. No, right? I'm I mean, a birder, so I know that better than anyone. Right, like I said, there's 400 species of warblers, 750 species of fig wasps. The likelihood that there's two in those groups that look almost exactly alike, pretty high. So just by looks alone, that doesn't prove or support they're the same species. If they perform the act of mating, then they are the same species. Okay, so they can mate, but we need to look at the offspring, right? So no, that's not good. If they mate successfully, and their offspring can also mate successfully, all are the same species. Oh, I like that, right? Because evolution says that you have to continue the species on. So not only can they mate successfully and have offspring, but the offspring, you track to the next generation. You go two generations and you say, oh wait, they had offspring. And they had offspring and they had offspring. Okay, that sounds good. If they can both asexually reproduce, okay, uh, no, let's just stop there. I don't want to even read on. That's just nonsense. So D is the best one. The way that you can have support that one species or two individuals are of the same species is that you see them mate, you see their offspring, and then you watch their offspring and see if their offspring go on to mate and have offspring. So you've got to keep it through at least three generations to show that that first generation is of the same species. Would both questions come up with that? What did you say again? Would that question come up with that, like an example of the male and female? Yeah. Right. Yes. All right, so how do new species arise? called speciation. So over time, what can happen is new species can arise because they change so much from the original group. This can depend on two processes, how we get new species in the world. We're gonna look at both of them. Could be isolation, which we talked about, and that could be what we call genetic divergence. So isolation means that the species has left the group. I'm sorry, excuse me. The individuals, a group of individuals have left. Now, could they have done it consciously, perhaps, but also, we talked about like the founder group last time, but also maybe like something happens where they just get cut off 
from the rest of the group. There's a flood, and all of a sudden, they can't get, these guys were over here, and these guys were over here, and they can't get to each other anymore because of this new river that is between them, or an earthquake. There's an earthquake in a huge valley, or a huge mountain comes up. So there could be things that happen that they just get separated, or it could be like the founder effect where they're just, whatever's happening, maybe it's overcrowding, disease, etc. a group of them will leave and go elsewhere. Genetic, di genetic divergence. The groups become isolated. We just talked about all the different isolating mechanisms and they become a new species. So we're gonna talk about two kinds of speciation. Divergence, remember, means that genetically they are diverging or going away from the original group or the common ancestor. Divergence, they're going away. They're taking their gene pool or their gene pool is separated and things happen, the process of evolution and natural selection happen differently in the different environments. So what is selected for from the original group to the group that got separated may be very different. And so then they start to evolve because of natural selection, because certain characteristics in the two different environments are selected for. Advantageous traits are different because the environments are different. So the process of evolution starts to happen differently. Allopatric speciation, a geographical barrier. Something happens where a river, a stream, a flood, an earthquake, a hurricane, something separates them from one another. This is the most common kind of speciation or genetic divergence. Because in general, it's not like species decide that I'm going to go to Europe. I'm going to pick up and move. No, they don't, they don't consciously do that. Usually, something separates the group. <laughs> They're off to Dubai. They want to go live a luxurious life. So the gene flow is blocked. They can no longer share genes because they're physically in different places now. They're separated. As I said before, the separation may be that the advantageous traits in the two different environments are different now. So for example, let's say that there is a merging of the continental plates and they come against each other and one goes down and one goes up and a mountain forms. There's an earthquake and then you have this mountain spontaneously. So now this side might have the sunny side of the mountain. And so they're very in a warm, they're in a very warm climate. So it is advantageous to have maybe like thin fur and have really long ears to radiate heat off the body. And just thinking about like those two physical traits. Now the mountain on this side, it's a very dark and cold. They don't get as much sunlight. The advantageous traits over here are going to be thick fur and real small ears so they can keep the heat on their body and they can stay warm. So just because of that one thing, that mountain, makes the two environments very different, which makes advantageous traits here very different from the advantageous traits here. That means that they are both experiencing the process of natural selection differently. Nature is selecting for different, favorable, or advantageous traits. Let's say that we go through a thousand generations and over that time, the plates, the continental or tectonic plates are moving and the mountain is getting smaller and smaller and smaller over time. And in a thousand generations, maybe like 5,000 years, 
That mountain is small enough that they can climb over and they can meet back up. Here's the key thing. If they are different species now, or the same species still, is that when they can meet back up, if they can mate successfully, and their offspring can mate successfully, then they are still the same species. But when they come back together and mate, if they can have offspring, but their offspring don't develop or are not able to reproduce themselves, they are not fertile, then they have become, over that long period of time, different species. So here, what happens is, is that you've got a group of lizards, they live on an island, few of those lizards are like, hey, this is a cool log, and then a wave comes and takes that log with them away. And they end up on this island over here, and if this species of lizard doesn't swim, they are isolated now by this area of ocean. And over time, perhaps you can see like a little mountain here, maybe because of the mountain, the green color is favored. Could also be that because that mountain is there, maybe the sun, they can blend in easier. And over here, maybe these, the group, they were better at climbing, just to, you know, randomly better at climbing. And it is more advantageous because there's a predator over here on the ground that they're like, oh, we gotta climb trees to survive and get away from the predators. So it's more advantageous to blend in with the bark. You can see clearly what is favored in terms of just the physical coloration is very different. And the ability to blend in with grass and hide, hold still, so that your predators can't witness you or see you. And these, that they are better climbers. That over time, what's happened is, is that you can see what's favored in the two different environments is very different. And let's say that a log comes along again, and a few of these come back over here, and they try and meet together, but they can't have fertile offspring, it means that they have become two different species, or speciation has occurred. Sympatric speciation, this one's a little bit less common, or I shouldn't say a little bit, it is less common. There's no geographical barrier, they're in the same place. So we're talking more about ecological isolation here. There's a lot of species in one area, so they start to specialize and go, well, I was born with a bigger beak, so it's easier for me to eat bigger seeds, and it's so crowded here, and everybody's trying to get the little seeds because most of the population has these little beaks, but my beak is bigger, so I can crack open those bigger seeds. You can see that within one environment, because of the crowding, individuals are forced to utilize their traits that they have that are different in order to survive in the same environment. And so over time what happens is, is that the ones with the big beaks are gonna hang out by the trees that produce the big seeds, and the ones with the little beaks are gonna hang out by the trees with the little seeds. And so they might be in the same general area, but they just don't really like interact anymore. And over time, because they become so specialized, they start to go, well, there's a lot of individuals with those small beaks, and there's not enough small food but we have big beaks and the big beaks are like, there's tons of these big seeds available. And those of us with big beaks can eat that. What the females are going to do is they're gonna be like, I am going to try and mate with big beak males. It's favorable to have a big beak. And the females are like, well, there's a lot of food, a lot of big food, not a lot of small food. Is it worth me getting like one of a million of those little beaks? Or should I try and focus on the one a uh, hundred over here that has the other big beak? And so then the females are selecting for males with big beaks so they can have offspring with big beaks who can easy, more easily survive in the environment. What is happening is those females are looking for males to allow them to have offspring who have less competition. Right? If you've got a million with small beaks and there's 
a hundred with big beaks. And the big beaks could eat the big seeds and the small seeds, but the small beaks, the million of those, can't eat those big beaks. Those with the big beaks have less competition for that big food. So they're going, oh, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go for this because there's a lot more that we can eat when we have big beaks. They're kind of internally thinking about and maybe not cognizantly acknowledging that they are looking for the big beak males to keep them having less competition or less competitors, right? Competitions generally hurt both species, even though there's often a winner and a loser. Let's say that you're going to have a boxing match and your competitor is pretty good and you're pretty good. I mean, unless you're just like, you're amazing and the other one's like bad, right? They could just come in and punch them out and be like, I won. But likely what's happening is they put you in the same weight class and there's a lot of like classifications to get you in the same ring together that you start fighting. Is there a good chance that both of you are gonna walk out not getting smacked in the head or smacked in the side? Probably not, right? You're both gonna punch each other. It could take 10 rounds before someone falls. But even though you're the winner, you're still hurt. You still got some wounds. And so competition in general, it's going to hurt both of you. Individuals are looking for ways that they can have less competition. What am I physically, behaviorally, physiologically, what do I have, what am I specialized in that will allow my offspring to also have those advantages? That's evolution. So here, you've got a fly population, and with these flies, they're eating apples, they're feeding off the apple trees, it gets really crowded here, and some of the flies are like, well, I'm gonna go over here because that tree has different apples. But it depends on if you can survive on this other tree. Do you have the characteristics? So those that have the characteristics to survive over there are like, I'm gonna forget this overcrowding and I'm gonna go over here where it's less crowded. Mutations, mutations, right? The reason why variation exists in a population is due to mutations. Plants are weird. If you ever take a botany class, you'll be like, whoa, plants do all kinds of things and have evolved in all kinds of ways that we generally don't see in the rest of species around. So let's go back to this. During the process here of meiosis, let's say that you get, right, you would have, if the species number is 20, the process of meiosis will produce sperm that have 10 chromosomes each. That's normal. Plants sometimes do what's called polyploidy. Polyploidy means that you've got, the process of meiosis is happening, and at the last step, or one of the steps in there, that instead of ending up with 10 chromosomes, 10 chromosomes, 10 chromosomes, 10 chromosomes, from one original cell, you've got four sperm, all with 10 chromosomes, that you end up with a final sperm with no chromosomes, and this one over here has 22. It's got two sets. So if this one has a mistake, and it has 20, now these are the same species here, and it goes over, and fertilizes an egg of the same species, and so let's say, oh sorry, this would be 10. They're the same species. There's a mistake in meiosis. Oh, it's divided. Yes. So a mistake in meiosis happens so that instead of this having a 
instead of the sperm having 10 chromosomes, because the chromosome number for the species is 20, so what we would expect is that the egg and the sperm would both have 10 chromosomes, because when they come together, they bring back 10, a set of 10, and a set of 10 to make a set of 20 chromosomes, or two sets of, two sets of 10 to make 20 chromosomes. But there's a mistake in the sperm during meiosis, So in this case, there's a mistake in meiosis. The sperm ends up with double the normal amount. Sperm and egg are gametes. Gametes come together, a gamete and a gamete, a sperm and an egg. And instead of 10 plus 10 equals 20, that doesn't happen. Sperm contributes 20, so we get the 10 plus the 20 makes 30. But Wait a minute. But here's the thing. Normally, that much extra DNA, this is not going to develop. There is no way. There is even a little bit extra. Think about humans. If a human has three 21 chromosomes, that's right, you have two. When you have what's called trisomy 21, or Down syndrome, there's a lot. Because you have one extra chromosome, it ends up the extra proteins, the extra good stuff, confuses a lot of things in the body and causes disorder. So here's an example of, you know, you might often think like, well, if I'm missing a chromosome, certainly I'm missing the ability to do a whole bunch of stuff. But here's a case where like the idea that more is better, when we're talking about genetics, more is bad. You want the right amount. So here, you know, humans, one extra chromosome, ends up with all kinds of issues, systemic issues. What a whole extra 10. But plants can, they can develop some. That's called polyploid. Poly means many. Is it because they don't have like a giant like organ system? No, nothing is different with the exception of, yeah, you think like, oh, it's gonna have something really big doesn't happen like that in plants. What happens is, is that the offspring can't reproduce. They don't produce gametes themselves. So the result of this, while you can have these two get together, the offspring that is made, it is infertile. It can't have offspring. Oh, like seedless watermelon. Yeah, right? It's so much easier to eat because you don't have to spit out the black seeds. Seeds have gametes inside. That means there's like babies inside of the seeds. So think about that the next time you eat watermelon with the that seed. Makes, that makes you feel well right? You're spitting out the seed. You eat an apple and the core has probably about five seeds in it and you throw those seeds in the garbage. You just threw away five babies. Okay. Yeah. You eat a peach. The core, the pit has a baby inside. Throw it away. Oh, we're so awful. But what humans have done is they've seen this process of polyploidy occur in certain species, and then humans do this artificial selection. We manipulate natural selection to favor us so that we don't have to spit out those seeds. We can see, we can take watermelons, and we know that sometimes those watermelons will produce seedless ones. So we can select for that. And then when people go to the grocery store and they're like, hmm, I could get this one for $6.99 or I could get this one for $6.99, what do you think most humans go for? This one, right? So if you, if you got another plant that was the exact same with the third chromosome, those two can reproduce or no? It depends on how close. It depends, it's got to be from the same species that this mistake happened. So we can, you can mess around, like if you go into um, botany and specifically if you go into like agriculture, you can, you'll like perhaps mess around with a species and see what happens. Okay, so they can only reproduce another polyploid plant? Right. 
but the polyploid results, the offspring. So this is just seeded watermelon, and sometimes the result of seeded watermelon produces those without seeds. So they're the same species. So, so two polyploid actually can't reproduce because they're not even fertile in the first place? Exactly, they don't have any seeds. Yeah. They don't have any babies. Oh. So you have to keep, keep getting the mistake from this, because this can't go on to make more of this. It doesn't have any babies. It doesn't have any seeds. So here you have the two side-by-side, -side, allopatric speciation, a geographical barrier comes through. Let's say there's a flood and there's a stream. You can see just visually that one thing, one characteristic in the population that we're going to take a look at is the color, is that you have white as the color of these mice. And over time, there's a separation. When you go through a thousand species, what you might find, is what's favored in this environment is the brown or the beige and this the white is favored and over time you might see that this coloration it's more favored to have darker fur and when they come back together they can't mate with each other successfully when we're talking about sympatric speciation this happens in the same environment remember when i was talking about the big beaks and the little beaks very similar that these do something in the environment with these that favors them, lessens the competition, and eventually over time, even in the same environment, they might come in these two are like, you're cute, but oh, we can't have fertile offspring. So since the Pleistocene age, a long, long, long time ago, deserts have been gradually forming in the southwestern United States. As the original lakes and rivers of the area shrank from connected streams into isolated streams, the fish living in them developed a strong potential for what? We have a separation that has happened, and then later we come back far, 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 far in the future. What have they developed a potential for? Speciation, right? The ability to become different species. They experience the process of natural selection differently over time and perhaps become different species. So the streams are, are, are separating the species? <coughs> yes, we have. What's, oh, so I didn't just tell you the answer. Was that an example of allopatric speciation or sympatric speciation? Uh, allopatric? Yes. So, Allopatric speciation, right? Physical barrier separates them. Process of natural selection happens differently because different traits are favored in the environment. All right, so what happens is if nobody's favored, you have a new environment and nobody's favored, it's called extinction. Extinction, check this out. Extinction has happened to 99% of all species. Not surprised when you think about how long the world has been around and yeah. how many species Oh yeah, yeah, and some of them may have existed for a really long time. There could be a species that existed for a billion years, and one changes the environment and they're all gone. Tribal mites are actually an insect fossil from the Cambrian all the way up to the Permian, like so the, so. They were around a long time, right? And, and then um, after like the Great Nine, they just Yeah, yeah, so it's, there's no guarantee. As, as long as you've been around, there's no guarantee you will always be around. The environment has always been changing. The environment is brutal, right? One day we can have 20 inches of snow. Look. Yeah, I know. The environment can change really quickly and fiercely. Okay. Hurricanes, all of a sudden you're living on an island and a hurricane comes. Everybody dies. Everything dies. Yeah, it's a, the environment is brutal. Climate change is brutal at times. Sometimes it's subtle and sometimes the dinosaurs got knocked out 65 million years ago. Boom. Within a few thousand years gone. Okay, I, I don't have time. We have to talk about other things, so I will not play those videos. But you are vulnerable. Species in general 
are vulnerable, you are more vulnerable, susceptible to extinction if you do not live in a widespread area. You only live in this really small area of the world. So if something bad happens in that area of the world, bye, right? Everybody is gone. Or you're over-specialized, like pandas. Pandas only eat bamboo. What if there's a fungus that attacks the bamboo, and the bamboo all starts to get really gross and unedible, inedible, whatever that word is. Their food's gone. And you might start to feed the panda, the panda's like, oh, I see carrots on it. And they're like, mm, I'm not gonna eat that. I don't know how. My body doesn't digest it well. So whatever it is, that their food, that's the only thing they eat. If your food's gone, you're in trouble. Interaction with other species can cause you to go extinct. All of a sudden, the predator species, they just start to grow and grow and grow for whatever reason, they eat you all. There's a parasite, like I mentioned, the fungus, knocks out your food, parasite internally, starts to kill off everybody, Parasites can act in a wide variety of ways. Or you're just competing for the same thing. Something happens to 75% of your food supply. Everybody's competing now for 25% of the food supply. It's going to be rough. Humans have a huge impact. We talked about that with climate change. But also humans will destroy environments, ecosystems to build, to like let's say rainforest, right? There are companies that go down to South America and they burn down huge amounts of rainforest and they plant pineapples. One species, they have killed off millions of species in that area. All right, so what are the benefits of biodiversity? Why do we, why should you care about other species? Do we not rely on a lot of other species in the world? Uh, yeah, we have rely on producers, algae, plants, cyanobacteria to produce oxygen. So we need that. We eat other organisms. We have what's called a microbiome. There are a huge, there is a huge community of organisms that live in and on us and keep us healthy. We rely so much on other organisms. So one is yeah, we gotta survive and we gotta live the way we wanna live, right? We need trees to help us build houses. Is it ethical to kill off, to go, is it ethical for a company to go to the rainforest and burn down 100 acres to grow pineapples? It's not ethical, right? That's not doing the right thing. Could we live without pineapples for, you know, when, when I was a kid, things like tomatoes, we only got them in the summertime. Strawberries, blueberries. There's a lot of food that was only available half of the year. How do we eat Well, I, but I'm just saying like we, but now you can have strawberries all year long because there's all kinds of unethical pra practices that happen so that I can have my strawberry smoothie every day. Right? Because it's supposed to be Yeah. 